machine learning series part one on uh, parametric modeling. Uh, today we'll be focusing on geometry. This is part of a three-part series that we'll be doing on parametric modeling over the next two months. Before I get started, I just want to give you a brief introduction to CA Associates. Uh, CA Associates, if you are unaware, is an engineering consulting firm in Middlebury, Connecticut, and we specialize in finite element analysis and CFD analysis. Uh, we've been an ANSYS channel partner since 1985. We're one of the first ANSYS channel, channel partners. Uh, we've been providing sales and support of, of the ANSYS products since that time. This presentation today is part of a series of e-learning webinars that we've been offering. Uh, if you didn't uh, get a chance to see some of the previous seminars. Uh, the good news is that we record them and you can access them either via our website under the e-learning section uh, or on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to youtube.com uh, and search on CA Associates, uh, these recordings uh, for these e-learning seminars will come up. And there's probably about 20 or 30 of them up there at this point. Uh, like this one, they're all about uh, 30 minutes or so long. And uh, we try to address specific types of applications uh, within the ANSYS software. For any one of these seminars, if you are a New Jersey or New York resident, uh, you can earn continuing education credits for these by attending the full webinar, and then we just ask that you complete a survey, which we will email to you after the presentation. I want to point out uh, that our website, caeai.com, has a fairly extensive resource library. We're continuously adding material to this library. Uh, it contains things like consulting case studies, uh, conference and seminar presentations. Uh, we do a yearly update seminar uh, where we uh, try to uh, characterize all of the new features in the, the current release of ANSYS. And those notes uh, always go up on the website in this uh, resource library. Uh, you'll find the release notes or, or update seminar notes from the past three or four update seminars. I think we go back to about version 12 on the, on the, <clears throat> the website. Uh, things like software demonstrations, like we're doing here today. Uh, and also, we, we say useful macros and scripts here, but uh, more appropriately, we also have ACT extensions that we've been developing. Uh, there are several uh, useful ACT extensions for the workbench environment that we have available to our customers on the website. And the content searchable, uh, I find the easiest thing to do is just simply go up to the search bar, uh, search on a particular topic, and see what comes up. And it will generally take you to the resource library. We also, on our website, have been uh, putting up weekly submissions to our engineering blog. I would encourage you, if you have a chance, to just browse through the blog and see if there's any topics there of interest. And if you in enjoyed the blog post or you have particular questions as to the subject matter, feel free to comment on the blog. And, and we get notified as soon as there's a comment on the blog, and then we try to respond to that fairly quickly. Uh, I just happened to paste in. Um, one of the couple of the blog entries from a previous week, uh, in this case in particular because I recently wrote a blog uh, that describes the differences between direct and feature-based modeling, which is essentially what we'll be talking about today in this e-learning seminar. We also have a training calendar available on our website. Uh, you can register for the training uh, classes that we are offering right there on the website. Uh, you can also uh, contact uh, CA Associates if you're interested in having uh, training on site at your facility. On to today's subject matter. Uh, today we will be giving you a brief introduction to parametric modeling in terms of using uh, the ANSYS finite element tools in conjunction with various geometry modelers. And then we'll start with part one where we deal with different types of parametric geometry that we can work with. Uh, we'll start by going through a brief discussion of feature-based geometry, uh, what are some of the pros and cons associated with that, and then at the end of this particular seminar, we will talk about direct-based geometry. One of the, the new ANSYS products, Space Claim uh, Direct Modeler, uh, allows you to take a direct approach to that geometry generation. Uh, in about a month or so, we'll follow up with the seminar with part two, where we'll focus on setting up the parametric finite element model. That'll be primarily with the mechanical tool. And then another month after that, we'll finish up the series with part three, where we'll use the parametric model for design studies and uh, automatic optimization using uh, things like the parameter set and the design explorer tools within the workbench environment. 
If you have a question at any point throughout this um, presentation, uh, most of the participants are currently muted, but if you have a question, feel free to type it into the chat window and we'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. So as far as parametric modeling is concerned, it's a, it's a very useful tool for evaluating the sensitivity of your design. And when we talk about design sensitivity, what we're really referring to here is the change in the response of a system to changes in its input. And systems tend to be more uh, responsive or reactive to changes in certain input uh, variables versus others. And one of the key elements to, to having a, ro a robust design is to determining what those sensitivities are and making sure that your design will be able to handle any of those potential variations, whether they're manufacturing, material-related, or, or, or loading-related. So typically, when we're setting up a parametric model uh, in the finite element world, we're going to be using things like geometric dimensions that may come from a CAD model. Uh, we're going to be using uh, the material coefficients. So they may vary from lot to lot. We may want to look at the sensitivity there. And we're also looking at potential changes or variations in the loading magnitude. And those can all be set as input parameters uh, within our finite element system. If we talk about the response or the output quantities, we're looking at things like the system mass and other entities of interest like reaction forces, displacements, and then strain and stress in a structural analysis. So understanding which of these inputs uh, affect the outputs of your system can help you increase that robustness of your design and avoid any potential uh, surprises when that product hits the market. So one of the most challenging parts of starting with a parametric model is getting parametric geometry. Uh, if you have a CAD model, you may inherently have a parametric geometry already. But one of the issues that we typically run into is that the design intent that was used to develop that model on the CAD side is sometimes at odds with the design intent that we have in terms of the optimization. So the parameters that are defined in the CAD model are convenient for developing that geometry or potentially manufacturing that geometry, but they're not necessarily accessible or available to us to do uh, design sensitivity studies on the strength of that part. And that, that, that becomes a very common um, issue uh, when we're dealing with, with directly with the CAD models in a feature-based sense. So when your design intent is fully aligned, your parametric goals are right there. It's pretty easy to accomplish. But as I mentioned before, very often that's not the case. And the good news is that we have options uh, on how to get around that without too much effort. So most of our commercial CAD tools are what we call feature-based. And we're going to talk about feature-based geometry for the next few moments. So feature-based systems are uh, geometry systems like some of the commercial codes we know, like SolidWorks, Cro uh, uh, Creo Parametric, NX. Uh, Design Modeler is a geometry processor, not a CAD system, but a geometry processor that's an ANSYS product that is also feature-based. And when I say feature-based, what I'm referring to is that you're creating some sort of 2D geometry, some planar geometry like a sketch. That is going to have dimensions associated with it. And then that sketch is going to be used in a 3D operation to create the solid, whether it's an extrude or revolve or a sweep type of operation. Now, in this particular situation, we have several advantages. One is that both the 2D sketch geometry and the 3D op operations are parametric, so we can control them. We can also share those parameters with the analysis tool and drive the changes in the geometry from the analysis side. The other advantage is that the geometry generation has a history. Uh, you typically see on the left-hand column of your CAD tool, or in the case of Design Modeler in the outline window, the list of operations that were used sequentially to create that geometry. So you know exactly what happened and each step in which it happened. And if there's an issue with the regeneration of the geometry, something doesn't regenerate correctly, it's very easy to go back directly to that point and correct it. Uh, and then make sure that the downstream functions all are updated as well. But it's right there laid out in front of you. It's easy to modify. It's easy to edit. We can add additional functions within that history because it's all laid out there in front of us. So let's take an example, um, a simple example here of Lego Man. Uh, and let's take a look at how we would approach this from a feature-based geometry standpoint. Well, Lego Man, uh, he's, he's getting on, and uh, he's going to need a hip replacement. So we've been tasked, in this particular case, with redesigning his hip joint. So I'm going to switch now over to SolidWorks, where I have a simple model of Lego Man's hip. 
And we're going to look at some of the characteristics of how this model was set up and, and some of the uh, aspects of this particular feature-based model that we can utilize from a parametric standpoint. So if I wanted to do certain things, uh, like, for instance, move, change the distance between the two bosses on the top of the hip, I can go to that particular function. And that function right here would be this boss extrude operation. I can go to the sketch itself, and I can look and see what dimensions were used to size the original location of that boss. So right off the bat, I see that I have a distance from the center line of the hip, and that's going to be a useful parameter for me. So I'm going to go and I'm going to edit this sketch, and I'm going to pick on that parameter. Now, with most feature-based CAD systems, there's an internal nomenclature that's assigned to the particular dimensions. And we can bring all of those dimensions over into our feature-based tool or our analysis tool, but it becomes very difficult to keep track of which ones are which because they're somewhat arbitrarily named, or they appear to be arbitrarily named because of the CAD nomenclature. So what I like to do is go in and first name these dimensions, uh, uh, give them, assign to them a name that I'm going to recognize in, in the analysis tool, but also give them a common prefix that allows me to filter out just the specific parameters that I want to work with. So in this case, I'm going to put in my particular uh, preferred prefix, which is MP for my parameters, and I'm going to give the dimension itself a name that I'll be, ab that I'll, I'll be able to readily s recognize. And that's going to be just the boss offset. Let's look at some of the other parameters here. Um, here's, here's a nice one uh, over here that we can use. Uh, we can basically say, take this guy over here and make it the, again, the MP for my parameter prefix. And we'll just call that the boss width, W-I-D-T-H. Okay. So I've, I've named a couple of parameters here in the sketch. Um, I can exit the sketching mode right now. I haven't done anything to actually change the geometry. All I've done is essentially reassign names to that. Uh, let's see. So now we're at a point where we have our dimensions defined, and we could go into the analysis model at this point. But there's another thing that we can take advantage of on, on this feature-based side, and that's using what are called name selections in the ANSYS tool. So I can go right into the ANSYS pull-down menu, and there is a, a tool here called our feature called the Name Selection Manager. If I pop that open, uh, I can pick on particular areas of the geometry and create or groups of the geometry or name that geometry so that I'll have access to that by that group name on the analysis side. So we're just going to create a simple name selection here. Notice that it has a prefix associated with it. I'm going to keep the default prefix for this case. And I'm just going to call this the boss top. Spell it right. Okay, so I've got that one. Um, that's pretty much all I need because we're just trying to illustrate what's going on here. So I'll close that. Now, at this point, I'm ready to go to ANSYS. So I would use the pull-down menu, uh, select ANSYS Workbench. And I already have it up in place here. And the first thing that we're going to see when ANSYS opens is that it has inserted a geometry item onto my project page. And if I look at the details of that geometry item, it's referencing that SOLIDWORKS part. So one of the key aspects to a feature-based connection to the analysis tool is that it's using the CAD system itself to read that file. So that says that I have to have both the CAD system and the analysis tool on the same system, and I have to be able to run them uh, both simultaneously, because I'm going to be utilizing SOLIDWORKS in this case to bring this geometry into ANSYS. So if I've done everything I needed to do from a uh, parametric standpoint, uh, or from a defeaturing standpoint, I can simply go and drag and drop a static structural analysis right onto this geometry, and then just open up this particular geometry in mechanical, and start setting up my find and element model. Now, in my case, I may want to do some extra defeaturing. There's also another tool available to me. If I right-click on the geometry, you'll see that I, I will have the option, my uh, context menu pops up, to either edit the geometry in Design Modeler, that's the feature-based geometry processor within ANSYS, or I also have this new option to edit the geometry in Space Claim. Again, Space Claim uh, is a direct modeler that was purchased by ANSYS in 2014. So we now have access to it as, part, as one of the ANSYS products. So we're going to bring this into Design Modeler. But before we do that, what we'd like to do is specify the details of the geometry that we're going to be bringing into that tool. So I'll start out by saying I'm, I'm going to bring over solid bodies. I don't have any surface bodies that I'm concerned with. I do want to bring across parameters, so 
but I want to make sure that I align the parameter prefix with the one that I used when I set up my parameters on the SOLIDWORKS side. So that's my, my MP or my parameters prefix. Again, that's user defined. Uh, we're going to include some name selections here. We'll, we did use the default name selection prefix, so it should just filter out the ones that we called out there. If I've assigned material properties to my CAD file, uh, I may want to bring those across. Those will get inserted into the engineering data uh, of the analysis system. So that basically keeps me from having to reassign materials when I open that, that particular part up in Mechanical. So we'll click that on. That's always a good idea. The other thing that I like to bring in under the advanced systems, it, I like to import coordinate systems. So if there's any data planes that I've specified uh, on the CAD side, I can have them accessible as uh, coordinate systems in the analysis tool. So at this point, I'm ready to bring that geometry in. So I'm going to right click over here on the geometry again. And I'm going to choose to edit this in Design Modeler. And once again, Design Modeler is the geometry preprocessor of the ANSYS Workbench environment, and it is a feature-based system that will work directly with the CAD tool. So here's Design Modeler. When we open this up, let's bring that back up here. Well, design Modeler, cooperate. There we go. Okay, so the first thing that we see in the outline tree is we have uh, a series of global planes, uh, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, and then I have an attach feature. Now that attach feature is defined by the fact that I chose to, to edit that SOLIDWORKS file in the geometry item now in Design Modeler. We'll look down and we'll see that our, that our geometry options are already set. These are the options that I set on that project page. You can always come back and modify those locally inside Design Modeler if you choose. So at this point, we're just going to say Generate. And what we're doing now is instructing or sending a signal back to the CAD tool, SOLIDWORKS in this case, telling it to read the geometry and transfer that geometry now into my design modeler preprocessor. We'll give that another moment. And you get a little progress bar down on the bottom there. And boom, we've got our part. So I'm going to turn off my transparency just to make it a little easier to view here. Now, why would I want to bring this into design modeler? What's the purpose? Well, very often, you're going to do things to your geometry that are, that are executed for the purpose of your finite element mesh or your boundary conditions. So rather than put those types of features on the actual CAD tool, I can keep it in its pristine state and simply make the defeaturing operations that are geared towards the finite element model uh, in my geometry defeature or, or design modeler in this case. So a couple of quick things. Um, this is going to be a symmetric, this is a symmetric geometry. I'm going to be putting on symmetric boundary conditions. It's all one homogeneous material. So it satisfies symmetry conditions. So I can use one of the, one of the tools here for symmetry and specify that I'd like to create a symmetry plane uh, on the, Z, the global ZX plane. I could locate a, a local plane. I could do whatever I need to do there to get that symmetry plane established. We generate that feature. It essentially cuts the part in half. And when I bring this into mechanical, you'll see that it also applies uh, symmetry boundary conditions to that cut face automatically. A couple of other things we can do. Uh, if we wanted to remove some unwanted features, let's say that we weren't worried about uh, having the boss uh, in the part, we can simply select the faces that are associated with that boss. And we can use what's called the face delete operation to essentially take them off or just remove them. So I'm defeaturing uh, the, the geometry. I'm taking away parts that I don't necessarily need. Um, other things that I like to do from a, from a geometry standpoint uh, for uh, my finite element model is divide the geometry up such that, such that I can get uh, a brick mesh in as many places as possible, right? what, what we refer to as a swept mesh of brick elements. So I could do some things like pick some edges here. And let's use those edges as a slicing tool. So we'll extrude those edges. Uh, we'll make that a slice material operation. Uh, define a, a vector for that. That looks pretty good. And then specify that instead of a fixed operation, it'll be through all. And essentially, we're dividing now the, that geometry into multiple pieces. Now, if I want to make sure that I have um, consistent or, or, or shared nodes at the interfaces of these various bodies, um, I can select the bodies here. I'm just saying right-clicking and picking all in this case. So let's go to select all there. And then there's an option to form this into a part. Now, when I form this into a part, that tells the mesher in the mechanical tool to invoke shared topology 
and to assume that there's a common area between these different bodies that's shared such that I have to have common nodes. Uh, <clears throat> I skipped over one little section here when I imported that geometry. Uh, one of the important things to note is when we scroll down to the very bottom of the details, we'll see the CAD parameters that we specified on the SOLIDWORKS side. So let me dra drag my window over here so we can read the, the full name of those parameters. Okay, so there's my MP boss width and my MP boss offset. These are currently what we refer to as local parameters inside Design Modeler. I can edit these values and then go up to the top of the details menu and tell it to refresh or use my Design Modeler parameters. So that says take the parameter values that I've defined locally in Design Model, Modeler, send them back to SOLIDWORKS and give me the regenerated geometry. So that's an example of a bi-directional connection uh, where the Design Modeler tool in ANSYS is able to communicate directly with the CAD tool. Now, if I wanted to get ready to set this up for a system level parametric analysis where I want to use mechanical, I want to have input and output quantities of materials and boundary conditions uh, and stresses, and I want to track those either with a parameter set or, or in an automated sense, I need to add these parameters to the global or the project parameter set. And we do that simply by clicking on the little box to the left-hand corner. You'll notice that the parameter values are now grayed out but when we return to the project page, we'll see that the parameter set has now been added. When I double click on my parameter set, this is where I'm now going to have access to those local parameters. So I can change the values here uh, and again invoke a regeneration of the geometry by simply right clicking and, and choosing regenerate. Now, th these are the uh, parameters that we defined uh, at the CAD level. Uh, one of the other things that we can do here that can be advantageous is to define local features or lo create local features inside Design Modeler and then relate them parametrically uh, to the CAD parameters. So let's just take a simple example here uh, where we're going to pick on the edges along the bottom. Now we're going to probably be interested in stress right at that bottom section there. So I'm going to extend my selection to all of those edges and then create a blend, a fixed radius blend, and we'll give it a value of say about uh, 0.05 millimeters at this point. So we've created that blend there. Again, this is a parametric feature. Let's make it a little bit bigger to prove that. So we change the value, and we can see that the fillet radius increases. And it also has an option to add this to the system parameter set. So if I click on that, I, it's, Design Modeler will prompt me to name these parameters. So we'll just call this one Boss Fillet. Uh, I also like to do things like, even though the, the parameter prefix is not required, I like to put a DM on the front of my design modeler parameters so that I can identify them directly as design modeler parameters in the parameter set. So we'll click on OK there. Let's return to our project. And notice in the project parameter set, I now have this DM boss fillet that's been added. So I have CAD level parameters and I have design modeler level parameters. And in addition to that, I can go down to the expression that's assigned to that, in this particular case, the design modeler fillet, and I can make it a function of one of these other parameters. I may want to make sure that my fillet radius is always smaller than the offset that I've given the boss, because I don't want to push the fillet over the edge of the hip joint. So I can set up a, a, a basically a, an alphanumeric relation there that says that it's some percentage of, of that total offset, and relate those parameters together. Typically, in a situation like this, we're going, to be, we're going to be utilizing the CAD parameters as the independent parameters and making the local defeaturing parameters uh, or the design modeler parameters, in this case, a function of that, simply because of the history-based aspect of this feature-based approach where if I change parameter values and I re request an update of the geometry, it goes first to the original CAD tool, regenerates the geometry at that point, then updates the design modeler geometry and adds the subsequent features to it. So it's always a good idea to, to drive the process with the original CAD parameters and have any subsequent parameters that you've used be functions of those. So I'm going to switch back to uh, my PowerPoint document for a moment here. So essentially what we've done is set up a system where we're using a feature-based CAD tool and then the feature-based geometry modeler, design modeler, 
and we're, we're, we're adding those parameters to the global parameter set and relating them if needed. At this point, from a feature-based standpoint, uh, we're ready to go and start setting up the actual finite element model. And that's what we're going to save for, for part two of this particular series. I'm going to switch gears now and uh, talk about uh, another situation. What if we don't have a very convenient CAD model that has CAD parameters associated with it that we're interested in, that we can utilize? Uh, what if the CAD model itself for the geometry model was non-parametric, if it was a parasolid, an IGIS, or a step file, something that was exported from a CAD system? In a situa situation such as that, there's no CAD system that I can send information back to to do the, the regeneration. So that could be the case. It could also be the model that you were provided is in a format that you don't have access to. It's a solid edge file. You don't have solid edge. What do you do at that point? How do you then make this, uh, this geometry parametric so that you can do an optimization study? Uh, the other more common one that we mentioned uh, early on is that the feature dimensions that were used to create the feature-based CAD uh, don't support the analysis goal. They're in contrast or they just don't even describe what we need to do uh, in terms of evaluating the analysis sensitivity. So when we run into situations like this, uh, we may want to take a direct modeling ap approach. And that's where this space claim tool comes into play and becomes more advantageous for us. Space claim is a, an excellent tool for upfront conceptual design as well, where we may not necessarily know what the design intent is, but we'd like to be able to do uh, some sensitivity studies and determine what that is and, and then have that drive uh, the ultimate design intent when we build our, par our parametric CAD model. So when I open up space claim, and I can open this as a standalone or I can open it as a geometry option inside the workbench environment, the first thing that I'm going to do is import that CAD file. So I'm going to come over to uh, that CAD file. And, and one thing I want to show you right off the bat here is if I choose to open up a file, there's a whole host of different formats that the space claim environment is able to read. Now, it's important to note that we're not utilizing the CAD tool to do this. We're reading this file directly into space claim. So essentially, we've severed any parametric association that may have existed if it was an actual parametric file. We're basically starting from scratch with a static geometry. And inside space claim, we're now going to build uh, the parametric aspects that we want to evaluate. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on my, uh, my same part here, the SOLIDWORKS part uh, for the hips. And you can see we've got the geometry in there. It reads in fairly quick. But it's important to note here that there's no history of the feature base. Right? Now we're taking a direct approach where we are selection-based uh, versus feature-based. Well, we can do a lot of the same things uh, that we could do uh, in the feature-based tool. Like, for instance, if I wanted to create a plane here and slice the geometry for symmetry using that plane, you know, there are options to do that. We'll slice this body using that plane, and we'll remove, remove that side of it. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Hold on one moment. One nice thing about space claim is it's got this nice little undo feature. So let's start again with the plane. Let's split the body. I'm going to split that body. I'm going to use that plane. And then we're going to take... No, it doesn't want to select my plane. There we go. And we'll remove that side. There we go. So uh, we basically cut this thing uh, in half like we did with Design Modeler. Um, other things that we can do that are, that are kind of interesting, uh, we, we did that face delete operation um, on the key over here. So we can do similar things here on the space claim side. It's called the fill operation. And it's basically the, the, the same approach. You go in and you, you pick the geometry that you would care to remove from that particular part and use the fill operation to take it out. Again, one nice thing about the space claim, it, although it does not have a history associated with it, it does have an active undo-redo buffer um, that uh, is basically stored in the active memory for your current part. So as you're, when you're operating in your particular session of, this, of space claim, it keeps track of everything that you did, and you can incrementally undo or redo certain items if you choose. So we brought our little part back there, uh, that little boss. Uh, one of the reasons I, I brought it back is Let's say we don't really know what the length of that boss needs to be. That's, that's going to be uh, basically a, a constraint region for the model. And we may want to study the effect of making it larger or smaller. Well, one of the things that we do fairly easily is pick on one of these surfaces, even though we don't have any of the parameters that were used to create that boss originally. We can grab on that surface and just stretch it manually. Think of this. This is direct modeling. It's very much like, uh, like morphing this like a piece of silly putty. Uh, 
that particular offset can be stored as a parameter. I could go up here and create a parametric group for that or a ruler dimension. Uh, I could do things like pick all of the, the, the surfaces. Let's say I wanted to put a fillet down on the corner here. Uh, we could pick on that edge right there. We can use that pull functionality to add in a fillet. And again, make that particular fillet radius a parametric dimension that we'd like to modify and utilize. It does all kinds of other cool stuff. Uh, this is one that I like in particular. Uh, if we wanted to, to move this particular geometry, well, let's say, let's say we wanted to just move this hole. We can pick the hole here, select the move function, and choose to shift the location of that hole. And again, there's going to be a, para a parameter associated with that. I could, I could angle the hole or rotate it. There's all kinds of freedom here to move your geometry around. Let's say we wanted to uh, move the entire boss. Well, let's pick the entire boss and let's kind of drag it a little bit. Now this, this is one where I, I definitely want to have a parameter associated with that. So I'm going to use what's called the measure tool here, and I'm going to pick on a reference edge, reference it to the center line, and say I always want to use the minimum distance between that edge and the center line. Create a group for that. That now becomes my boss offset. And I can rename these as I see fit. But basically, I'm creating local parameters. I have total freedom to, to work with any particular part of this model. Again, you can Grab this guy right here and, and elongate that section. Make the hip a little bit longer if you wanted. Uh, I can divide this up into multiple pieces. I can enforce shared topology the way I could with a feature-based model. But the key to this is I'm not constrained by any of that history uh, that was used to create it. So the parameters are really mine to grab. Um, I'm going to show you one more thing on the defeaturing side that's useful. Uh, if I pick on a particular surface, uh, design, uh, the space claim environment allows me, if I pick on it, so it's this, in this case we picked a radius of a certain size, notice it gives me the option to extend that selection to all the rounds of that radius size. So I can pick on those, and I could fill them if I wanted to remove them. If I wanted to bring them back, the undo feature is there for me to do that. So lots of flexibility, uh, lots of, of, of tools here that you can use from a conceptual design standpoint. Again, you're early on in your design phase, you want to determine what the sensitivities of that design are going to be so that you can evaluate them and find the, mo the most robust configuration. That will then drive your design intent as you go to document this particular um, design uh, using your feature-based tool for manufacturing or, or, pr or production purposes. So once again here, I'm going to uh, very quickly just switch back to my PowerPoint document. Um, and. One last thing I wanted to show you, much like the uh, feature-based approach, when we uh, define those groups or those parameters on the, so on the uh, space claim end, uh, they get added to that local parameter set. Now we'll see them in the parameter set, and we can operate them on them and make them uh, functions of other parameters in the same way we would with the feature-based approach. It's just we had the full freedom to create whatever parameters we wanted uh, from that original geometry. It's also important to note at this point that both of these approaches, the design modeler uh, feature-based approach and the space claim approach, didn't necessarily require that we start with a CAD model. Uh, we could go in and do full conceptual modeling by creating the geometry from scratch in either one of those tools. Uh, however, very often you have some geometry that you're starting with, uh, and that being the case, both of those tools will be able to read that geometry in for you to operate on it. So let's just summarize uh, what we've talked about here. Uh, when we talk about feature-based modeling uh, in terms of the advantages, uh, the sharing of those CAD parameters between the original CAD tool and the analysis tools can be beneficial in several situations. Uh, we can parametrically drive the changes from the analysis side because there is this association or this, this communication that goes on between the analysis tools and the original CAD geometry. We can create local parameters. Uh, that can be either in mechanical or in design modeler. They can be geometry related or they can be related to other input parameters and make them a function of those original CAD parameters. And, and with feature-based tools, as I said, there's always a geometry history that you can review. You always know exactly what steps were, were followed to create that geometry. So if you run into an issue, you can go back to that point in the process and correct it accordingly. Now let's talk briefly about the direct modeling advantages that we just uh, reviewed. Uh, the first and most advantageous part of this is that a parametric CAD file is not needed. Uh, we can get right in, 
read that geometry in and just start modifying it uh, or creating local parameters as needed. Uh, the local parameters can be shared with the analysis tool, so we can use those local parameters to drive an optimization um, type of process. And there's no dependence on the original CAD intent. And as I said a moment ago, there may not even be an, an original CAD model with an intent in place. You can start conceptually uh, with the Space Claim Direct Modeler and determine what your most robust design is going to be and use that to then drive the design intent uh, when you create a feature-based documentation of that particular design. So this is a very good tool for upfront concept modeling. It gives you the full freedom to create those two geometries uh, and then study them from any particular aspect that you may choose. 